Hello everyone, um, I'm Zoe and I'm an archivist at Worcestershire Archives. Um, this is our presentation to celebrate South Asian Heritage Month. We are Worcestershire Archives um, and we're a joint service with the Archaeology Service and together we make explore the past. Um, so this is our presentation um, just to introduce the idea of some um, South Asian connections within our collections. Um, so there's a few images of items that I'll show you as part of this presentation. Um, but the aim of the session is just to increase awareness um, and to make sure um, as many people as possible feel welcome to use the service. Um, we're going to look at some records, as I said, in the collections that have a connection with South Asia or our shared history and um, a behind the scenes sneak peek video of um, things like the repositories and the conservation area and the digitisation studio. Um, we might get to hear your thoughts if you want to make any comments at the end um, and that would be lovely to hear from you. Um, and then as part of this, I'll go through about include about how to deposit records with us. Um, and that's a great way to ensure your you and, for instance, the community is represented within our collections as well. And in case you're thinking of becoming an archivist or you haven't even thought about it, but um, perhaps people you know might like the idea of it, I'm going to just go through um, the route you might want to take for that as well. So Worcestershire Archives, what do we do? <laughs> well we're part of Worcestershire County Council, um, we're based at the Hive building, that's the golden building in Worcester um, that houses um, the library collections as well. Um, it also has the university library collections as well. Um, so you'd see a lot of the university students there. So we're on level two. Um, and as I said, we're a joint service with uh, with the archaeology service. Um, and we, we do hold a lot of Worcestershire County Council um, business records. We um, preserve and make records accessible, accessible where it's appropriate to do so. Um, and we have around, someone's calculated, 12 miles of documents. It's not just documents we keep though, so we have, um, we have photographs and other, other formats, including electronic formats. Um, and these date from the 12th century all the way up to um, more or less the current day. Um, and those, the, the type of things that they um, cover is anything from Worcestershire's people, buildings and landscapes um, within Worcestershire. So, and, and also the boundary of Worcestershire has changed over time. Um, so it really is anything to do with Worcestershire. That's our collection remit. It's things to do with Worcestershire, the county. So um, other, another thing to mention is if you were thinking um, you might like to deposit records with us, um, so we can keep them safe for you and make them accessible into the future. Um, but you're not quite sure about it because you're worried about the type of information in, in them, which might be quite sensitive or, or personal to you. Um, we are used to working in compliance with GDPR 2018, as you would expect. Um, so we do have highly sensitive information um, and we look after that as a matter of course. So for instance, medical records, adoption records, local authority records, um, coroner's records as well. Just to give you a little snapshot there. Another thing we thought would be lovely to look at is our Explore the Past website. So this is the Worcestershire archives and archaeology service website. So Explore the Past is our brand, if you like. Our website is, is separate to um, the Hive library um, or the Hive building, I should say, website. Um, although you can get to our website through the Hive website. 
So this page here will tell you about the archive service as as well as the archaeology service. Um, there is a meet the team section, so it's no no secret. You can see the staff that you'll meet when you get here. <laughs> um, so we've got all the staff here by me there. Right? You can, and then you can just also see what we're interested in ourselves. Um, so we also have a page about our collection. So we've got our catalogue. Not all of our records are on the online catalogue. Um, we also encourage you to come in and look through our, our paper index slips. Um, we have things like maps, so we have a database and photographs, so those are really interesting. Um, we have a guide which will give you an overview. So this is free to download. This is what it looks like. There you go, and that gives you a real overview of the different types of records that we have. Um, we have, I mentioned our paper index, we have um, a video on how to use that just here. Um, so you could familiarise yourself with that if you wanted to before you even get here, which is quite handy. We have a blog, which is really lovely to sign up to, um, and the blogs tend to focus on a particular theme um, and they will mention specific records in our collections and give you the references as well. So if you are wondering, oh, I'm not quite sure what to look at, but I do want to see something original just for the experience of it, you could dive into these, you can search them here or you can just have a browse and see what's published in each year. And you could just take your references off that if you like. Um, so that's a nice place to start. Um, if you want to contact us and ask us any questions, or if you want to get in touch to um, deposit something with us, you can use one of these options here. It really doesn't matter which you choose, we'll make sure it gets to the right team. Um, but if you wanted to ask something about um, researching, you might want to use this one, or if you want to deposit, it would be this one. If you want to work with us about um, a community project, and get some information about how we can support you it would be this one community engagement and there's other options but essentially just click on one of these fill in our online form and um, we'll make sure we do get in touch and help you um, so i'll come out of this now so um i mentioned um we have a lot of Worcestershire County Council records. We have some other district or borough records as well. Um, we are the designated record office for the Diocese of Worcester. So we are pretty heavy on Church of England records such as parish registers. Um, we are very keen to um, develop our collections um, to include other denominations, faiths or religions. Um, minority um, communities, um, family, we, we do have um, family records um, and that's landed untitled families as well as not. Um, businesses are something we'd like to develop, so uh, Worcestershire's businesses. Um, charity records we have um, in the collections as well. Um, but things like um, society society records um, or that sort of thing, we would we would like to um, include more of in our um, collections, especially where they do represent um, communities that that we have less about. So the types of things that we collect are anything from kind of photos, diaries, um, so a variety of media, digital um or paper um so another thing that i didn't say is um although worcestershire is quite an agricultural county we actually have um we don't really have as much as you might expect um in terms of records that document that 
so if if you um would like to donate anything of that nature we we would be very keen to receive that as well because it just makes sure we um we capture what Worcestershire is about um so that over time we can give um a more accurate picture of how the county has changed so as part of the deposit process you would be asked to complete our accession form um so that's really enables you to tell us how you would like the records to be used um, and you can let us know about any access restrictions there should be um, and that might depend on any um, personal sensitive information in there. Um, you can also tell us about any copyright um, so if you're the copyright owner or, or if somebody else is you could choose to donate it to us or not um, and we will really um, act as as you request us to so we won't do anything you you're not happy with at that point so it's a really key um stage to leaving um or not leaving depositing your records with us for safekeeping um so in terms of actually using the archive the, these are some um points that a researcher has made um and he's from the south um, Asian background as well. So it's really lovely to hear his comments. Um, so he said for prosperity, so the first people that migrated to the UK um, are dying out. So um, it's really lovely for future generations to um, find out this information. And obviously the more that is um, donated to us, the more, the more we um, can offer to researchers in the future. Um, also, he said, to research history of the local area, um, for instance, there's planning applications or plans for development um, and, and maps, that sort of thing. And just to see how perhaps the area you live in has changed over time. Um, he's given the example of the Arboretum area and that that used to be known as Little Italy. And that's something I didn't know about because there were a lot of Italian families living out there at one point um, and he said this area of history is a great one so um, I've managed to find a couple of things about that area to add to this presentation and we'll look at those in a bit. Um, other places you can look at are the National Archives um, they actually have their own database discovery and that has some of our collections on there um, but they have collections uh, that show um, my, the migration of communities, um, less so for the South Asian community because I've read that um, they tended to come by, um, but uh, they tended to fly here and they don't have a um, record of flights. It tends to be um, the registers of ships that they have. Um, but anyway, so Ancestry Online, you can find that about military records on there. Um, and you can search by the place that the person was from. So, for instance, Asia uh, or India, more specifically. Um, so, um, Leicester Save Our Sounds is a lovely place to look at oral histories. So, there is a section here about, I think it's emigration. That was the theme. And there's different themes anyway, and you can search through the recordings. Worcestershire Archives is um, has has um, given some of its collections um, to be added to this as well. Um, in case you're wondering, so that's a nice um, little archive to be aware of. Um, just going back to the presentation. Um, so this researcher has commented that using online portals such as Ancestry to research military history can lead to using local archives, so um, such as Worcestershire archives. Um, and the Muslim community have relatives who were taken prisoners in the Second World War, and that might be something that um, you're not you're not aware of, um, but you could then certainly use Ancestry to research that and ancestry um, as well as find my past um, is free to access 
in um, the hive and as a live bris. Um, he's also said, you might like to use the archive to answer the question, why choose Worcester? So out of all the places you could use, why Worcester? Um, and he's given the anecdote that Warsaw was the intention, but it was mistook um, by some as Worcester. Um, so, and he then was interested in finding well, what was it like when the first generations moved here? So he was interested in some of the trades, that sort of thing. So for instance, you might like to look at the, the types of trades that we're about using our local studies collection of books. So the local studies is part of the archives collection, um, kind of as, as opposed to the library collection, and you you um, wouldn't be able to take these books out, but you can sit with a drink and um, something to eat and look at them in our self-service area. Um, you've got to make sure your drink has a lid, I should point out. Um, so it's quite relaxed, you can come and have a browse um, and just see what information you can find out. So for instance, there's one, one book about the leather glove industry. Um, um, another one is about the glove trade. And that has um, information um, on the customs trade with France, agricultural and manufacturing, so that seems a bit broader. Um, the secret source, of course, this is Lee and Perring's source. Um, and there is obviously links to Bengal there. I have some notes. Um, Lee and Perrin's Brand of Worcestershire Sauce um, was first sold in 1837 by John Wheelie Lee and, Hen and William Henry Perrins, and they were dispensing chemists from Broad Street, Worcester. It was inspired by Marcus Sandys, third Baron of Sandys. Um, um, so they're the Sandys family of, of Ombersley. You might know, um, see, see their name in Ombersley quite a bit. Um, who had served in Bengal, um, and he tasted the fish sauce there, which he tried to recreate, but it ended up being quite putrid until it lay fermenting for three years. So that is someone's um, information about the impairing sauce, but I'm sure in this book you could find out a whole lot more. Um, so there is a report on the former Hill and Evans Vinegar Works. That was just something I added because I, I was aware there is there used to be a vinegar works um, in the kind of Lowesmore area in Worcester. So just a heads up when you're researching archives, it's not quite like uh, being able to search by subjects like you would in the library. Um, so it's useful to think about who, who, what type of family or what type of business or organisation or government department would have created the records um, that might contain information you're after. Um, so the way we describe records tries to keep collections together um, by the creator of the records. So that's very much kind of the mind that you need to be in. Who would have created them? Uh, and what types of record sets would they have created? We call them record series. Um, and it's very much a case of just having a sift through. Um, so for that reason, it can take a little bit of time and we get to know researchers they tend to um you know we get regulars that we get to know and you end up sometimes knowing more about the information that they contain than the staff do so it's quite a special thing really to become familiar with a set of records Um, so I'm going to switch over to the behind the scenes tour and this is going to contain the areas in our repositories for new deposits um, and look at some of our other repositories, repositories that have things like maps and photos, the original archives and self-service area on level two, conservation and digitisation studio. So it's very much a quick um, snapshot of these areas. This is document quarantine. Um, everything is protected, so you need to swipe your path before you can come in here. So these are some of our latest deposits waiting to be boxed up in acid-free boxes. So we just note down as the items come in and we go through the, the accession process according to what the depositor has requested from us.
So again, coming down into this corridor, this is restricted access. And this is the main corridor, corridor with all our strong rooms. Um, so this one here. So we keep the lights switched off to keep the conditions as best as possible for the documents. Um, this uh, strong room is where we keep the recently accessioned items. So for instance, what can we see? The cricket club record, the county cricket club records that have come in recently. Another one is um, also St John's Cycling Club. And I actually then saw them at the local park meeting up, which was quite funny, a few days later. Um, Braves of Malvern, that was a shop that's closed down recently, unfortunately. So you can see the diverse range that we have. So this is another room, repository E, and you can see these are not boxes, these are rolls of quite large maps a lot of them are very large indeed um, these are packed flat there you are so a lot of these can be os maps or they could be tithe maps or um enclosure maps so this is another one of our strong rooms room d and it's one that you would come into if you signed up for one of our uh, behind the scenes tours so for instance this this document here is Worcester's first charter um, of 1189 uh, and Richard I bestowed rights upon the city and there is a translation just here and we actually have a blog about this document we also have William Shakespeare, the William Shakespeare's marriage bond to Anne Hathaway. Um, I won't actually show you the document because that's one of the things that we show off quite well as part of our behind the scenes tour, which um, you have to contribute a little bit of money to. Well, I'm only part way down the corridor. There's still quite a few more rooms. <laughs> and we have one very, very cool room here which is where we store a lot of photos there we are oh chilly chilly so this one is kept extra cool just because of the different photos we have here they need a cooler temperature um these photos in the, in the boxes are part of our uh, worcester photographic survey collection uh, so they all have a unique number and they are on our database online. You might recognise this. This is just the main atrium as you enter the hive. And this is the main staircase you see. We have got lifts of course, in case you need to use the lift. So if you walk up the stairs, just one level. One level, two flights. <laughs> uh, you will then see... The explore the past service desk and this is where you would come to view original documents but you can also view our local studies collection of books and the palfrey books as well they're a separate collection and this here is where you can look at records on microfilm and also uh, maps you can also use these computers to go on the Ancestry Institution website and find my past. So we've got newspapers, hard oh, newspapers on microfilm. We don't have the originals here. We have some of them on microfilm. And here we go. Uh, the different plans on CD as well. And also what you might be interested in over here things like the old trade directories which are really lovely this is one um, it's quite a pretty example actually that's why I chose it and you can see this is in the Digbys area 
bathroom. This is a schedule of events. It's quite nice, you just get a little bit of an idea of what people would have had, what conveniences and what shops and different trades people would have been about at the time. It was 1885 to 18... 88. <laughs> so the other thing that you might find interesting are the electoral registers as well. We also do have things like wills and parish registers. Uh, the marriage index is here. In case you're interested. So this is the conservation room. And you can see there's various workbenches. So the conservator takes on work from external clients as well as documents that are stored in Worcester Shire archives. And this is the digitisation studio um, for our internal uh, digitisation specialist and he carries out both work for Worcestershire archive collections and external work as well so if you do need anything digitised we can do that here for you. Okay so um, hopefully you enjoyed that um, behind the scenes snippet um, and I will now show you a few items in the collection um, that hopefully you'll really enjoy um, as much as I have. So starting off um, in the Arboretum area. It's now known as the Arboretum in Worcester, but um, initially, at one, well, at one point anyway, it was known as the Pleasure Grounds. Um, so you can see, if I zoom in, there is, the entrance is here on Samson Walk, and there was a, like a long walk up to a fountain, which is described as being similar to the one at Great Whitley if you know that the um, English Heritage Place not far from here in Worcester. Um, there was a crystal pavilion and uh, a cricket pitch, bowling green, um, and archery butts as well. Um, so if you want some information about the development of the Pleasure Grounds or the Arboretum, um, we have a book here by Frederick Covins in the Local Studies Collection. Um, and these are some documents of the development of the area. So it was um, it was the Worcester Pleasure Grounds Company and they, they issued a prospectus um, for a shared capital of £5,000 um, made up of 500 shares of £10 each. Um, the City Council donated £1,000 for free access to the public for one day, and that was a Monday. Um, it opened in 1859, but um, it started to make a loss. So in 1866, it unfortunately had to close, but it was um, intended as an area for um, recreation and um, health and well-being. Um, so it is such a pity that it, that, that area had to change, but, um, it was advertised as freehold property and, and from then it was developed into kind of residential houses. Um, this area is not far, um, uh, from there, Shrub Hill, <clears throat> and this is showing the engine works for the, um, station. That's a map of 1864. <clears throat> this here is a map of um, the Holy Trinity district um, dated from the mid 19th century so if I zoom in a bit you can see um, different areas in this so there's Rainbow Hill um, and the Gasworks Lansdowne Road just there um, there's Runtswood. 
So obviously it's not very clear on this, but perhaps you would like to see it for yourself and visit the archives. Um, I should say the reference numbers of these items are in this slideshow, so you can scribble them down. <clears throat> so this is an OS map uh, of around about 1940 showing Rainbow Hill. So I quite like this one. Um, it shows there's loads more where the mini roundabout is now. Um, and there's things like um, hair cloth manufacturing. There's Worcester Vinegar Works is actually just off this map. Um, there's a can factory there. So you can see how the area will have changed since that time. Um, moving on, we have the connection um, to um, South Asia in our Coventry family collection. So Lady Anne, it, she was the ninth Earl of Coventry's daughter. She married Victor Albert, or Prince Victor Albert J. Dilik Singh, um, who was the eldest son of Maharaja Dilip Singh. Um, she married him in 1898. These photos here are a snippet of around about that time when they were married. Um, and they are extracts believed to be compiled by Lady Blanche Countess of Coventry in a kind of family scrapbook type of thing. Um, so you may know that the ancestral seat of the Coventry family is Croom, Croom Court. So that's not far from Worcester, obviously, out in Asian kind of direction. Um, yeah, I should say the, the National Trust have written a report um, with some information on the links to um, colonial history and slavery as well. So um, you might find that interesting. You can Google that and find that a bit more. Um, there in the collections, we have a codicil to the will of um, George William, 9th Earl of Coventry. So this is um, Anne's dad. Um, so he wrote this in 1914 and he includes his daughter in this um, and he refers to her as Princess Dulip Singh and he leaves her £50. And so there's a big clue or the answer to next week's um, uh, Monday Mystery if you're following our social media on Twitter or Facebook. Um, so this next one is an extract of a prescription book um, from the chemists. Um, and this is an entry for His Highness Prince Victor Dulip Singh. So it's um, slightly different to the kind of thing we would be um, described now. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, this here is a, is a document about the settlement of the estate of Thomas Lord Littleton. Um, the Littletons owned the Hadley estate. And um, this is the case of opinion of counsel in respect of the rightful owner of stock bought with the money set apart for the late Henry Peach from eight bonds in the East India Company, Bengal, and other effects from Bengal. Um, so this, I was thinking, mm, what's going on? Um, and I found that quickly. Afia Anthony uh, married her first husband, Joseph Peach, in Bengal. She returned to England after her husband's death, so after he died, um, and then she married Thomas Littleton. Um, so obviously this document is about the estate of Thomas Littleton. And um, after Thomas died, there was this question as to who was the rightful owner of the stock um, assigned to Henry Peach, which was her first husband's nephew. So that's what this document is all about. This um, is such a lovely example. I just thought of, um, it kind of symbolizes this talk in a way, um, the link between the UK and um, India, because this railway is, it says it's from Constantinople, but you can see um, there's the other uh, routes from the UK, just there, 
just thought it was quite a nice thing to show as it was quite symbolic and that's from 1885. Um, now we're moving on to another collection um, and it's the Lord Williams family uh, photos. So this photo is um, a group of judges in the Said Amir Ali in India and it's from 1928. Um, Sir John Ralston Lord Williams was born in Warsaw and he went on to become a barrister in London and he later became a judge in Bengal, India. So it's nice to see some Indian faces here. Um, unfortunately we don't have the names of these people but obviously we know one of them is <laughs> um, Sir John Ralston Lord Williams. So his family also have, um, we also have their, some of their photo albums of their travels in India, including Kalimpong. So Kalimpong is the name that's mentioned in our um, index, like a finding aid to this collection. But as you can see, there's other areas that they travel to as well. Um, you can see their family dog there. <laughs> um, here's more. That was, another lady in the family, the, the Lord Williams family, and you can see a variety of different faces and um, places. So this album is still the same family travels, but it's not necessarily Kalimpong, although I'm not sure exactly where it is in India. That's not um, noted, unfortunately. But, um, the Kalimpong area, though, is actually um, an area that kind of is not too far from um, from China, um, and there's trade links with China, um, so you can kind of see the kind of further east. Um, the, that, that in people's faces and their and their dress, I suppose. So it's it's um yeah, I suppose you can notice that, which is quite nice to see in these photos. But it's it seems like it's um the area is more on the border <clears throat> of India. Um, so these photos are taken from a book um called The Romance of an Eastern Capital. It was published in 1906 and it's by Francis B. Bradley Burt. This is, um, we have a copy in the Palfrey collection and the local studies collection. So the the Palfrey um, copy, you would have to look at in the original archives area um, and request that. And then the one in local studies, as I say, is um, slightly more relaxed to look at. Um, so this is um, a book about Eastern Bengal early years of Buddhist and Hinduism and later Muslim um, era as well. The landscape's mightiest rivers, and it calls them the mightiest rivers of the east. The kingdom of Vikrampur, the rise of Dhaka, Shaista Khan, who was a general and Subhadha, or um, I've written in brackets as a type of governor of the Mughal, of Mughal Bengal. And so he was around in about 1600 to 1694. Um, it covers the decline of the Mughal Empire and the Lakia River, Dhaka under the British rule and Dhaka of today. So obviously the today um, was around 1906. So these, um, or certainly the next photos, are on the Lakia River and these are transporting jute. And this next um, photo is from a book by the same author um, and in this book he is exploring the Indian Indian upland. Um, so he is um, the the author actually was a uh, member of the Indian Civil Service in 1896. Um, he was attached to the archaeological service um, and he married um, a lady, um, Lady Nora Beatrice Henriette Spencer Churchill, who was a cousin of the Winston Churchill, which is quite an interesting fact. Um, but in this book, 
he um, he covers um, this area of kind of mountainous uplands. Um, he goes into detail about uh, it's it's um, an area called the Santal Parganas, um, and it's about the Santals and Bahariya indigenous people. Um, it's as with the other book, it's it's his um, he, he's very factual, but it's also is an outsider's opinion or or um, interpretation of of these places and people. Um, so just bear obviously bear that in mind when you're reading them. Um, but it includes uh, its history, scenery, and inhabitants of the district, including themes like races, religions, and languages. It's, it's so detailed. The descriptions, both the books, are really interesting to look at. They're quite um, intense, so you might need to um, look at them over a few days. So here's some more. It's just lovely because you get to see. Um, the more rural parts of India. And even, I suppose, if you were to travel to these places today, um, they would have changed because these were taken from over 100 years ago. So this now is um, a selection of glass lantern slides. Um, these were conserved and catalogued as part of um, the Arthur Henry Winfield Centenary Project, and that's funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, they all these slides, glass slides, have been uploaded to a platform called Lucerna, which is a worldwide digital repository of magic lantern slides. So they are all accessible. The full collection is accessible. And I realise I focus more on India, and there was some of Sri Lanka as well, which. Um, if anyone's interested, there are there are at least a handful of um, um, slides taken in Sri Lanka. But um, the collection, this collection, um, are taken by Winfield during the 1880s through his UK, Europe, Asia, Africa, Australasia and the Americas. Um, um, so he, he obviously had a tour and was... Um, taking lots of photos along the way. And we do have a blog about um, these glass lantern slides and um, Arthur Henry Winfield as well. Um, so I will whisk through these. Obviously, if you wanted to take a closer look at them, uh, you can look at them online in um, the Lucerna platform. So I'm just going to go through Outreach now. Um, so Outreach is um, a group of staff um, that cover the archives and the outreach service. Um, so they work with us both and um, they run their own events, but they can also help you um, and support you with your own community heritage projects. So um, they can be quite actively involved with what you're doing or they can just offer advice, for instance, if you're applying for funding. So they can work with you on creating a wall history, working with your own archives, if you if you keep your own community archives, um, or they can help you record or investigate your local area through doing archival research, historic buildings uh, research and um, community archaeology. So they work with a range of people, um, including um, children and um, on youth projects as well. So, as I say, there's no right or wrong way to share heritage. They, they share heritage through um, a variety of media. So artwork, podcasts, drama performances, heritage walks, exhibitions, events and activities and talks. So there's just a few examples here. And the reason they do it is to preserve um, the, this information for future generations and make sure material is deposited with the archives or Worcestershire's historic environment record. So they can help you um, by um, helping you get some ideas together 
um, and give you giving you some tips and some best practice advice, and they can help you um, um, with putting um, a plan together to apply for funding. Um, so they can help you with um, an idea of costs for a project or with writing your grant application as well. So it just depends how much involvement you want from them. Um, so they can offer you, as part of running a project, training workshops in oral history, archive research and archaeological skills. Um, and they can uh, run events for all ages. They can help with digitising or conserving archive material. Um, and just the day-to-day -day managing uh, and running, running of a project. Um, so if you would like any information and um, you'd like to contact them about a project or an idea you have, you can contact them at explorethepast at worcestershire.gov.uk. But you can also go to our website and use the contact us section and we'll make sure they get that for you. Um, so in terms of if you would like to get into working with archives, um, first of all, there's a variety of different ways you can do that. Um, you can volunteer, you can get some work experience, you can ask. Um, lots of archives are willing to take on um, people for work experience or volunteering. Um, it helps us um, use our time more productively. Um, and also a lot of a lot of staff started off volunteering, so we understand that it's an important step um, in getting paid work in archiving as well. So where we can, we will help. Um, you can work as an archive assistant. Um, that's a lovely role. You, you get, get to know um, collections really very well um, and you work with lots a variety of different people as well. And that's like quite a hands on role within archiving. Um, and a public facing role as well. Um, obviously you can work in outreach um, and we also have our digitization specialist. So that's another another way of working with archives, uh, making sure that they're accessible remotely um, and making copies that perhaps can be used um, as opposed to handling original documents. Um, and also, there's the digital preservation side that um, has a more IT kind of technical specialist side. Um, I haven't mentioned conservation on here, but of course, that's another way to work with archives. Um, archivists, um, that specific role, ha um, you tend to need a postgraduate qualification and then typically a master's or a postgraduate di diploma. Um, and so that obviously you would need an undergraduate degree. I missed I missed this here. Um, this is just a heads up on paleography skills. Um, it's always handy to have a little bit of paleography um, under your belt. Um, and there's some free online um, exercises at um, the National Archives webpage. So you can have a go, it gives you some tips and um, you can actually start to translate some documents using that as well. So whether you're still studying or whether you just want to do this um, for fun or just in your own time, you can um, start to build on your paleography skills. And hey, you could also just come in and look at some documents and, and have a go at translating those. Um, so this diagram is just showing the kind of formal archivist um, and records manager route. So you start off with your undergraduate degree. Um, I think as long as you have the right experience and attitude and you can get that through volunteering or work experience, it helps have a lot of um, volunteering hours, um, a good few months at least. Um, you can make sure you're getting the right type of experience um, by following the farmer guidelines. So here they are, and this shows you exactly the type of experience you need to gain. It's just so that you can have the right knowledge um, in order to speak at an interview and get paid, um, paid work. 
So you can then apply for a pay traineeship and these tend to be up to about a year. Um, and that stands you in good stead for applying for a, a master's or a postgraduate diploma in archives or records management. Um, of course, you can just build up a wealth of volunteering, but it's nice if you can get a, a paid traineeship as well. Um, so the master's or diploma you need to do, you need to make sure it's accredited. So the Archives and Records Association, that's the professional body. Um, and that that um, has advice on the accredited courses and lots of information, not just to do with archiving, but records management, um, and which is working with current records um, and semi-current records that are still needed by the creator, like the business or organisation that's created them. Um, and so is that archives and then also um, the conservation as well. So, uh, and then once you've done your master's, um, you should be in a good place then to become um, an archivist or records manager um, or a, an assistant archivist or assistant records manager. Of course, there's other titles that um, mean the same thing. Um, it's just a matter of kind of finding them and unearthing them, if you like. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed that. I will. Don't forget you can follow us on social media and follow our blogs. Um, and it, contact us if you have any questions as well.